Welcome everybody to a new Living Theosophy series. It is especially auspicious to start on White Lotus Day, although it's, it is a little intimidating to be giving a talk next to HPB. <laughs> I'm sure she could materialize a hand to slap me if I... <laughs> but um, something that HPB I think one interesting characteristic is that she was always relating to people with the ideas that Michelle just read, looking at people or relating to them from that point where one is not or should not be too bothered by what happens around. Not that she wasn't externally, as those who know HPV's life. Well, she was a, a strange case uh, because of her occult training. But it, some people say even when she was in the feet of a, um, anger or a, a reaction, if you would ask her anything about theosophy, instantaneously she would be calm as if nothing happened and she would be talking, you know, perfectly calm. And, um, and then she would relate to people not with this attitude that we cherish so much in our culture. We are always trying not to hurt people's egos and we tend to be flattery and to make people feel well and maybe that's okay, but what we are actually doing is preserving the aspect of ourselves which is keeping us in a prison. Not that we should be um, unkind to each other, but that aspect that, that is constantly defensive is the aspect that, as I said, keep us in a prison. So she would never take care of that aspect of a person. And she would just, you know, say what she had to say without thinking, uh, oh, will this person be hurt or not? As long as, you know, what she said was, was true. Um, so it is interesting to see how to live with the ideas uh, that many traditions present is not very easy especially when we live in a society where we expect, are expected to do things, to relate to things. I remember Radha Bournier, the international president of the Theosophical Society, uh, she, she said once that she was in a meeting and then when the, the lectures were over, she went and sat by herself in a, on a bench, watching nature, they were in a very nice place, and somebody came and said, uh, what's wrong with you? Are you um, sad uh, that you are here by yourself or you are not talking to people? So we have these ideas that we should be constantly in activity, constantly relating, and there is no, no room for just silence, contemplation. So as we are going to see during this series, uh, we are going to explore the, the spiritual path. Uh, many of of these things actually, we will actually face uh, these difficulties and each person chooses how to, how to face them and how to address the, the problem. Some people, they just don't care if other thing, others think that you know, he or she is introvert or whatever they think. Some other people externally, they are you know, very, um, uh, relate to everybody, but internally they, they have the ability to stay more quiet. And there are different approaches, but basically trying to... Uh, I remember Jiddu Krishnamurti saying that if we are well adapted to a society that is spiritually sick, then that means that we are sick. So, you know, all these things are just to make us think. We, we cannot take any of these things uh, in a, to go to an extreme. But, you know, it's to bring some, some thought on things that we take for granted or 
that we may not pause to examine. So today we are going to start with a subject that is very central to theosophy in many aspects. And it was brought to the memory or, or brought again to the memory of the Western culture by Blavatsky. The idea of what she called Mahatmas or masters of the wisdom or adepts. In the East, there was always this concept of, in Hinduism, for example, the rishis, these enlightened people, heroes, not necessarily gods, but uh, saints in the, in the sense of uh, having attained absolute wisdom, or absolute from a human point of view. These rishis um, would stay in touch with humanity, although they may have died many years ago, they stay in touch with humanity and sometimes they bring teachings. A, a yogi or a, a teacher would say, uh, this rishi came to me either in a dream or some would say he just materialized and gave me some teachings. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, they also have this idea of uh, even, either bodhisattvas or some great teachers. Um, that, that also they would say, these teachings were given to me by Padmasambhava and, or whoever was a great teacher in the past, and that person either came in a dream or, or materialized there. Uh, some teachings are said to, be, to have been given by the Buddha, not the physical Buddha, but the inner Buddha. The Buddha had died, and uh, yet the Buddha was still giving teachings on the inner plane. So all this was, is part of the tradition in the East, but not so much in the West. We have the idea that uh, if you are a Christian, that Jesus is somewhere up there, that you can pray to him. There is a sense of relationship, but for the most part, people who say Jesus came and you know they would be looked at as, as people who are not necessarily in all their senses. Of course, Mary seems to yeah, Mary, I was going to mention, Mary seems to communicate more with, with people. There are many, uh, or a, a number of people that say that Mary came. Of course, it is always difficult when, with the knowledge of theosophy, we know that there are there are more planes or dimensions, that there are entities on the inner dimensions, and that if, it, if the person has a certain sensitivity, entities can appear to that person. Now, these entities may be mm, Mother Mary or may not be at all and just impersonate. So it's a very uh, complex subject. But the, the main idea is not so much that they can appear to a person, but the idea that they stay, these rishis, these bodhisattvas, they stay in touch with humanity and, and keep an eye on humanity to help with spiritual teachings. So many, many enlightened beings in India when or gurus when they are about to die and the disciples say, we are not going to have you with, with us anymore. Many of them say the body is just, you know, a shadow of what we really are. And I'll, I'm always there. I will, or, or this consciousness will be always there. And uh, a person who studies these teachings may connect with that consciousness, even without noticing it, and just receive a deeper understanding because there is a place where we are all one. So, so what Madame Blavatsky said is that, or brought that idea to the West, and she said there, there are enlightened beings who stay in touch with humanity. And these are what uh, Madame Blavatsky called masters. Now, the, the existence of, of these enlightened beings is a natural result 
of the idea of evolution. In a, in a philosophy, a theosophy that postulates a process of evolution within the illusory planes, you know, one man or the real never evolves because it's perfect in itself, spontaneously perfect. But within the, the illusory planes, there is a growth in the, in the ability to, to express the real. That's more or less the idea of evolution. So this divine spark is in all of us. And little by little, the, the person that is, is caught in the illusion of being the body, with experience, with uh, more and more insight into the nature of things, this person begins to realize, I'm not the body. The body is just a, a fragment of myself, uh, and neither am I the emotions or the, or the mind. And eventually, that person discovers his or her own, her true identity, which is one with the all. Now, when that happens, there is no purpose to have a body anymore. The idea being that. You know, in Hinduism, they say, why does the, the divine spark take a body? Because there is, because of the illusion, there is a thirst for physical experience. We have this thirst to experience the world through a physical body. But when the person realizes that he or she or it is far beyond the physical, then that thirst disappears. Therefore, the divine spark is not compelled to incarnate anymore. When that happens, the, the divine spark is like, can let go of all the lower vehicles and stays in its own nature. Sometimes it's called in Hinduism, Swarupa, its own true nature without any body. Let's say in the state of, this is what in Buddhism they call Nirvana. Uh, is the cessation, the an annihilation of all the, ve the lower vehicles of consciousness, or let's say the vehicles of consciousness, and only consciousness remains there. Of course, in the theosophical view, it is said that consciousness cannot be ever without a vehicle of consciousness. But uh, at this level that we are talking, uh, uh, there is no separation between the two. Now, the problem is that when this divine spark lets go of all the lower vehicles, it loses the ability to, to communicate with the lower planes. It's just like when a person dies, that person is still alive on the astral plane, but it loses the ability to communicate physically with us. Um, it can communicate astrally because we also have an astral body, but physically the, the vehicle to, for the physical communication it's not there, and therefore, to all, to our perception, that person disappeared. So the same with the divine spark. Although the, the divine spark is everywhere, to our perception, that divine spark is not available anymore, unless we can raise our consciousness to that very high level, which only enlightened beings are aware of. So, in the Buddhist tradition, which is in the theosophical teachings are in tune with that, there is the idea of the bodhisattvas that give up this dropping of the lower vehicles and entering in nirvana. And they do it because they, they choose to remain, to retain bodies so that they can still help people in the world, so that they can still be in touch with people in the world. For it is said that that act is a, a great sacrifice, because they could be in this state of perfection, with no limitation, away from any kind of sorrow, and yet they, they remain bound to the limitations that is to have a form. To have a form is a limitation. Of course, that's the only thing we know, and for us, we don't see it as a sacrifice. But for the person that 
knows the truth, that experiences the truth, to have a form in itself is suffering. That's why the Buddha said uh, the, the incarnated life, the limited life, is dukkha, is suffering. So they, they, they make a, a great sacrifice to help us. In a way, we could say, you know, it's like you, are do, you have a job to do, you do it to the best of your ability, you finish, and now you can go on vacation, vacations, and then you say, yeah, I'm really tired, uh, but, you know, I'll stay and I'll help others to finish also. And... Uh, but also you could see it as if you, being a human being, choose to incarnate as a dog, having all the limitations of a dog, you have still your human mind, but you cannot talk, you, you, ha you have to bark, you have to eat from dog food from on the floor, everything, just to help other dogs. You know, supposing that that would be necessary. And to help them become human beings. So imagine, because, uh, I, made, I put this example because Blavatsky said the difference between an enlightened being and a human being is similar to the difference between a human being and an animal because they step into a different kingdom of nature. So they, they make a, a huge sacrifice. And that's the idea of the bodhisattvas and it's the idea of the masters. So, in the theosophical view, the masters of wisdom, they retain a physical body. They are subject to be born like any human being, and they are bound to die in that physical body like any human being. They may live longer than human beings because they know how to take care of, our, of their bodies. You know, we as a culture have gone from a life of 40 or 50 years to a life of 80, 90 years, just with, with our, our knowledge in medicine and all that, while the adepts have also a knowledge of the inner processes of the body, and they are able to extend their lives more. I haven't seen numbers. In the Kichu Theosophy, somebody, the, the questionnaire that was HPB, but the questionnaire asked the theosophist that was answering, I heard that they live a thousand years, and Blavatsky said, no, that's an exaggeration. They don't even live half of it. Well, oh, okay, 500 years is not a, an exaggeration, or 400. And I remember Jiddu Krishnamuri saying once, uh, if not for all the trips uh, constantly around the world that this body was subjected to, uh, this body could have lived 400 years, he said to a friend. So maybe that, that's the idea of uh, an adept, how much he could live. But anyway, sooner or later they die, and they have to take another body. And they, it's not that they have to. They choose to take another body and be born. And then they say every time you, they incarnate on a body, they have to struggle with that body to, uh, to tame it, because matter has its own tendencies. And even an adept needs several years to bring the, the body in complete control. And this is even in the, in the stories of enlightened beings like the Buddha. There is always this idea that, you know, for a while he's a normal person until it, the, the higher consciousness is able to, to take, take over. Um, now, this... These adepts, although they retain a physical body, their work, the way they help humanity, is mainly on the inner planes. So the idea is that the same way that we have physical parents and, and that the physical parents accelerate our course of education, if we are, are left um, with no education, we would grow much slower. You know, we would get to know things by experience, um, but, but then the growth would be much slower. Because we have a family and parents that take care of us, the growth is accelerated. So in the same way, 
the, at the level of, of the reincarnating soul, the divine spark, as we said, is perfect in itself. But the, the, let us um, talk about three levels. The divine spark, then the reincarnating soul, and then the physical body, or the personality, the body, emotions, and mind. So the masters work at the level of that reincarnating soul to try to, to accelerate the, the growth of the... So they are like nurturing the, the human souls. And in that way, souls can grow faster just as a child can grow faster if he has parents. Now, we don't know what they do, how they do this. And of course, they, this is what Blavatsky says in the Kichu Theosophy and some other uh, writings. And she says, you wouldn't understand how they help uh, unless you know, you know that, re that dimension of reality. Another, another um, task or way that they help humanity is from time to time incarnating in a society and trying to promote a movement that, that will help humanity. Sometimes, even on the political field, although I feel that, that right now it would be very dif difficult, you know, cultures go through cycles also, and there are cycles where, where the people who are in charge are still more idealistic and more spiritual, and then there are cycles that the people who are in charge are very materialistic and selfish. And even if a good person tries to be there, the whole system would prevent you from changing anything. But there, there are some, it is said in the theosophical tradition that the, the French Revolution was the failure of some adepts to try to help on the political field. They were trying to, to because, the, the masses were being suppressed, you know, by the people that, with money and with properties and uh, kings and queens. And they wanted to, pro to induce a, a change, a political change, but then the masses of people reacted uh, with violence and they went out, you know, cutting the heads of, of rich people. Something similar happened with Gandhi. He was proposing this non-violence and, uh, and opposing to the British government by, not through viol violence, but by non-cooperating with the government. So he was standing once in, in, a, like in a protest or protest, and the police came and hit him, and he didn't defend himself. But he had a special insight into what, he, what the way to change this was. When other people following him were there and the police came and start, started hitting them, they responded back. And then there was a massacre and how many people died in India. So it's very difficult. You know, a leader may have a, a very high insight and ideal, but it's very difficult for the masses to, to be able to follow that. So it seems that some, something like that happened and ended up in what we know as the French Revolution. But anyway, the idea is that the adepts try to help sometimes on the political field, sometimes as, uh, on the scientific field. It is said that the, many of the early scientists that began the scientific revolution were either adepts or disciples of the adepts. But for the most part, they try to help on the spiritual uh, field, the religious field. So the great teachers, religious teachers that we had in the, in the past in all religions, they, they were these adepts in the theosophical view. I'm, I'm sharing the theosophical view on this. So um, Shankaracharya or the Buddha or Jesus, or, you know, all these, these teachers were adepts, and they try to teach, to point out the path to realize the truth, adapted to a particular culture, a particular time, the needs of the time. Now a third 
way that they try to help humanity, and that's the one that we are going to focus on uh, in this series, is by training some people that, may, that are ready to be trained. Training in what sense? Um, the more free people the world has, the, the more these free people can help, either on the physical plane or on the inner planes, as we were saying. So it is just like if you are trying to create a school, you may begin being, you know, you, you are the teacher and you start teaching kids. And then as the kids graduate, if they can help you, then you can start teaching more kids. So the, the more teachers you have, the more you can reach and the more you can do. So the idea is that there are some people, if, let's say, if there is, there is a person that is willing to help others, just like these kids, you know, suppose that one is willing to become a teacher. Maybe a kid, when, when he graduates, he wants to become a politician, make a lot of money and enjoy life. But maybe some other kids say, no, I will be a teacher, I will learn less, uh, but I, I want to teach other people also, I want to help them. So then maybe if you are the teacher, you will pay a particular attention to this kid and try to train it so that he becomes a teacher, you know, as fast as it is possible so that he can help you. Not that you are not going to pay attention to the rest, but to this one you will uh, train more specially, pay a, a more special attention so that he can fulfill that role. So it is said that in humanity where when there are people who want to who have this compassion and, the, and are willing to, to help others, and when they come to a point where they are teachable, some of these adepts may get in touch with, with this person. Now, the, uh, the idea of being teachable is very important because, you know, if you, are, if you have kids in third grade and you have, suppose you have now more teachers and then you are managing the school. Now, you know much more than these teachers that are all young teachers, but you are needed to manage the school. Now, when you see that some kids, you know, are able to, to become teachers, you may put some time aside to go and teach this particular kid. Uh, but you, you wouldn't do that with kids that are still too young. You let the younger teachers to teach the, the kids that are, are too young. It's just like a, a professor in the university wouldn't go and teach the primary school. Not because they don't deserve it or they are less human beings than the people in college, just because of a question of uh, just the, the, how things work. You know, if you are going to spend that time, a kid wouldn't profit from all your knowledge more than from a regular teacher. So he would teach only those, those young men that, or women that are ready to learn more. So that's the idea with the masters. When a person gets to a point that is particularly teachable, that, that has already learned everything that can be learned through books, through a normal living, through relationships, through personal experience of life, with an earnestness to, to do the right thing. So when, when the person went through all that, then if that person is willing to, has this, this willingness to help humanity, a master may begin to help the person. To help the person how? Grow faster. What does it mean? It means that the person will have to face the, the challenges of life in a more concentrated way. Because when we say the masters are helping a person, we may tend to think, oh, then the masters are, they are going to bestow something on the, these people and they are going to be happier and wealthier. And well, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> the, because 
the training is about learning who you really are. And our problems are because we cling to what we are not. So what typically this involves is that you want to grab there and there is a stick that hits you in the hand. And you say, oh, you want to grab there and the hit hits you in the hand. And if you want to grab it again, it will hit you in the, in the head. <laughs> so that you begin to, to understand where you have to look uh, or towards what direction you have to look. And stop wasting time in trying to cling to things that are not real. So with this, and we are going to explore all this uh, during this series, but with this comes the idea of the, the, the occult path. Occult in the sense of, uh, it means hidden. This path that is not that is not very obvious. You know, there is an obvious religious path. The person goes to mass if it is a Christian and tries to be a good person, you know, very, but there is another path that has to do not so much with what you do outside, but with how you live from the inside, the outside life. So we are going to explore this, but the occult path is like an accelerated Mm, course of learning so that the person instead of taking I don't know one more hundred year uh, lives to get to discover the the truth it will do it in 20 lives which means that you will have to go through the experience of 100 or 200 lives in 20 so those lives are usually more intense in the experiences. And you can see in many mystics why many mystics talk about the idea of suffering. The, the, that as soon as, uh, you know, with Jesus uh, bearing the cross or, or in, in other traditions also the, the idea that, that life becomes more difficult from a certain point of view. It is because, as, as I was saying, we need to learn. We need to go through the same that every person will, will do. But then we need to do it faster. Why faster? Because you want to win a race? Well, if, you, if that is your mentality, you are going to fail. Because as soon as, if, if a person goes to this path with the idea of winning something for himself, the first lesson is that there is nothing to win for yourself. Because yourself, what you think that you are yourself, is not you. Now, when you let go of that yourself, you discover that you are the whole. But you can discover that only when you can let go of yourself or your idea of what yourself are. So if you go with this idea that you are going to get anything, when the actual lessons come, which are going the other direction, you will drop it. Why would I do this? No, no, I wanted an easy life. Why would I do this? Now, the pace of growth is always determined by our own, and this is all very natural. The, uh, the, way, the way we put it, it seems like something more artificial. But it's all very natural. The, the, the more eager we are to discover the truth, the faster we grow. Now, why we, wa we want to discover the truth? Because we, are, we know because the, what is unreal doesn't satisfy us anymore. If what is unreal still satisfies me, I need to still live in the unreal until I get, you know, I get enough from the unreal. And then I say, you know, I don't want this anymore. I, I, I know that this is not real, so what is there? When we say what is there, then the order that is in life begins to bring you what the means to discover what is there. So all this happens, and although there are laws that begin to, to produce these effects, they are very natural. And we are the ones that, that dictate the pace at which we can go. We are going to, as I said, to explore all this because there are 
several details. I, I'm just trying to give a, a, an overview. But the idea is that when the person enters in on this path, the, the masters begin to pay attention to that person. As uh, Mother uh, Teresa of Calcutta, she said, you know, it is said that God never gives you a burden uh, that weighs more than you can carry. And she said, I wish God wouldn't trust me so much. <laughs> and it, it's exactly that. The more attention the master pays on you, well, the more you have to face. So I, I, I'm making, you know, putting some emphasis on this aspect because there is, especially in the New Age, the, the idea that uh, you are chosen by the master, you, are a you have a privileged life, now everything is harmony and love and peace, and you have money and you don't need anything, and every desire that you have will be fulfilled. Because, you know, in the theosophical view, maybe that's true, but I'm talking from the theosophical point of view, it's the opposite. Now, along with this, of course, there is a growth in, into any growth into reality brings a very deep sense of being alive, deeper than we had below, before. I don't know how to, to put it in words, but it is even, I, I think I, I used this example in one talk before, but it's just like when you are a teenager, you know, you live with your parents and life is very easy. We don't realize it when we are teenagers, but we don't have to take care of, of not even of ourselves, of, of kids, of houses, of paying, you know, the bills. But there is a point where that life is too much confined. That person needs to break away from the home and and begin to expand his or her field of activities. That will make life harder in the sense that he will now have to, to work and to get money and to take care of, of a family. But, but at the same time, an adult, a, a sane adult, has a, a, a deeper sense of of being alive or accomplishment or being or or life having a value than the teenager that is for the most part trying to to be amused and well deal with school as best as possible so there is a natural thirst for expansion even if that that brings more challenges so the same with the spiritual growth even if life becomes, you know, harder in, from a certain point of view, it also brings this sense of expansion, which you can feel w during the periods of rest. You know, when you are in the midst of a, a storm, you, you cannot feel any of that. But when the storm is over, then just as nature that is vi vitalized by storms that will take away half dead branches and then all the, it, the tree has much more vitality and it's green and you, you can almost feel that it's uh, flowing or, or producing vitality. In the same way, crisis produce that, uh, force us to get rid of things that were dead weight. And then when that ha passes, there is this sense of vitality or this sense of, of more being grounded. I don't know how to explain it. But so it's not all all bad at all. But I want to to put that aspect clear because in in our culture we tend to see the other opposite. Annie Bess and Ledbitter they they used to talk more about the positive aspect. Blavatsky used to talk far more about the negative aspect. Uh, I read once that Blavatsky was uh, was talking about discipleship to, to a couple of theosophists on a train. I think it was on a train. I don't remember the, the anecdote uh, very well, but the idea is that uh, either the masters drop a letter or told Blavatsky psychically or something, scolding her because she was 
uh, making these people be very afraid of the occult path. And so say, okay, slow down that, you know, you are scaring people. But at the same time, um, it's true. Where, where, when you, if you read the mystics, you will see every mystic complains and say, why what, am I so, so much of a sinner that I have to bear with so much? They all seem to be overwhelmed at times in an unfair way. If you read, I don't know, a, any mystic, but um, uh, Toller, for example, he was a disciple of Eckhart, of Meister Eckhart, Toller, uh, John Toller. Um, he used to, because, uh, th because this idea of suffering as a purifier, he used to torture himself, you know, very harshly. And uh, at, at some point he had like a piece of wood and he had some long nails through and he would put the, those nails piercing through his body and go like this. And then one, one day he fainted because he lost a lot of blood. So when he was recovering on the bed, Jesus appeared and said, okay, okay, I'm happy with your, all your sacrifice, but you don't need to do it anymore. Stop that. And then he says, after that, and then he had some, some dreams. I think it was taller. I may be mixing this part with another mystic, but I think it was him had some dreams where he was taught, yeah, he was taller. He was taught by uh, like a, a college, he said, on the inner planes. And probably a master contacted him. And now he says, but after that, I started really to really suffering. Because before, and, and he said, I was really surprised because I was proud that I could bear with anything, that I, I was self-afflicting, you know, my, uh, my body and I could bear with anything. But this kind of suffering is unbearable, he said, because it's not being produced by me. You know, when we produce our suffering, we still feel that we are in control. And he said, I knew that even when I fainted, I could remove, or, or once I fainted, I could stop doing this. But now it's not under my control. And, uh, and that's what scares our ego, that we are not in control. Uh, so he, he, it is interesting to see how he said, all the suffering that I you know, put on myself didn't really prepare me to face this. And um, so there, you know, the idea is uh, with more earnest people, people who are closer to you know, get done with, with this period of illusion, uh, they will have harder challenges. And the other people will have challenges at the level of what they can manage. But I, I, we are going to see, I, I'm not going to focus only on the difficult part of, of this process when we talk about the occult path. As we are going to see, there are you know, um, a lot of, Annie Besant said, because there is a point where the person understands the process. And Annie Besant said, uh, looking back into my life, and she had a lot of suffering also, since even before getting to the TS, uh, she lost her two children to, she got divorced. At that time, a woman being divorced was pretty much, uh, you know, a homeless person. So she lost to her, her husband, uh, her son, but could retain the girl. Now then we, when she was fighting for promoting uh, some methods of birth control among poor people, because she said, these poor people, they keep having more and more kids and they don't have how to, you know, money to feed them, and then they are all miserable, so she wanted to promote birth control among them, and the church and the state, they said that was obscenity, and, and she said she was, had a trial, and then they said, if you continue with this, you will lose your daughter, because you, we will consider you immoral 
to raise a daughter. And she said, my daughter is my daughter, but the daughters of all these poor people are also daughters. So she took the risk and she kept going for that and she actually lost the, you know, her daughter and they took it away from her. And then later in life, she also had a lot of uh, trials. But she said, when I look back, the only, mo the only moments that were really re relevant, important in my life were the difficult moments. They produced something. The moments where things were okay were resting moments. And it's okay, you know, we need to rest. But I, would, I could take away the resting moments and I would never take away the difficult moments, she said. And that, that is said to be always the realization of any person at a certain point. At a certain point, a person realizes how the difficulties were really blessings. And uh, in one of the Mahatma letters, um, one master says, there is a point where the adept, the adept receives a reward and symbolically speaking, that is far or uh, outweighs far more all the sufferings that he went through in the process of becoming an adept. So um, these things that we, we call suffering is really a blessing in disguise. At the beginning, we don't understand it and it's fine if you resent it, but inside, always remember that this is a blessing, not not a, a curse, although nobody likes to suffer, that, that's fine. But in a sense, it's like when you, you push your kids to go to school and then the kids resent having to go to school. But when you are graduated and you are an adult, you know, now you can have a life because you have an education. And if, if your mom had said, Oh, okay, poor thing, he doesn't like school, let him enjoy life and play with his friends, then he would be homeless or having to take a, a really hard job because he wasn't put or forced to do things that he didn't want to do. But later he realizes, yeah, of course, this was necessary and, and now I'm able to do this because of that. So in a similar way, the difficulties, you know, are ways are things that are necessary to go through so that we can dis discover who we really are. So it's like if you are climbing a mountain, you know, suppose a, there is smog, there is a, a city with a lot of smog, people are dying, they are poisoned by the smog, and there is a mountain, and somebody tells you, you know, at the top of the mountain, the, the air is pure, there is a community of people who are very nice, live a very beautiful life, uh, while down there they are all killing each other because the city is in a state of chaos. So you start climbing the mountain, and climbing is really hard, and then you are at night with cold, and you want to rest, but the more you rest, the more you delay getting to the, the summit, and then you just keep going and keep going until you pass through the, the smoke, and then you can enjoy this pure life. And you say, oh yeah, it was really hard to climb the mountain, but it was well worth it. So in, you know, the, the more you realize that you live, that there is a better way of life, the more strength you have to climb. So the, the idea with the spiritual life is that more and more we realize that there is something better, that is different, and that gives us the strength to, to advance. We don't have to feel guilty because of our pace. You know, that comparison is absolutely out of the question. We have to go on our own pace. But the, if we are earnest, we will discover progressively more and more that there is something worth making the effort. And that will give us the strength to accelerate the pace as our strength allows it. So that's more or less uh, this, the idea of this was uh, to do an introduction of what this um, series will be. And uh, we are going to talk about the, the path and also some spiritual practices that, are, that can help us in this path, on this path. So if there is any comments or questions, 
we can discuss them. Um, David sent out that uh, article, Divine... Mm -hmm. Divine David what? Bruce, the yeah, secretary. Yeah, the national the secretary national... sent it out. Do you want to read it? Yeah, if you want to read it. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Divine Witness by H.P. Blavatsky. You cannot invoke this divine witness, the higher self, with impunity. And once that you have put yourselves under its tutelage, you have asked the radiant light to shine and search through all the dark corners of your being. Consciously, you have invoked the divine justice of karma to take note of your motive, to scrutinize your actions, and to enter up all in your account. The step is irrevocable as that of the infant taking birth. Never again can you force yourselves back into the matrix of avidya and irresponsibility. Though you flee to the utmost parts of the earth and hide yourselves from the sight of men or seek oblivion in the tumult of the social world, the, that light will find you out and lighten your every thought, word, and deed. All HPB can do is send to each earnest one among you a most sincerely fraternal sympathy and hope for a good outcome to your endeavors. Nevertheless, be not discouraged, but try, ever keep trying. 20 failures are not irremediable, if followed by as many undaunted struggles upward. It is not so that mountains are climbed, is it not, so that mountains are climbed, and no further that if karma relentlessly records in the esotericist account bad deeds that in the ignorant would be overlooked, yet equally true is it that each of his good deeds is, by reason of his association with the higher self, a hundredfold intensified as a potentially for good. Finally, keep ever in mind the consciousness that though you see no master by your bedside, nor hear one audible whisper in the silence of the still night, yet the holy power is about you. The holy light is shining into your hour of spiritual need and aspirations. Just. <laughs> yeah, that um, HPB wrote that to, when she founded the esoteric section, she wrote that to the members. Um, but of course, that, that can be applied to any person that is earnest. And not only, as I said at the beginning, not only within the theosophical society, but this was the case with the, in any religion, you know. Uh, so um, we are going to see all that. I, I remember in one dialogue, Nisargadatta Maharaj, who was a jnani of, in India, he, he was a contemporary uh, sage. And um, he said, when you start getting in touch with, you know, with the real in you, uh, things may change, the ceiling may fall on you, uh, but if you keep trying, then the sun, you know, will shine or something like that. So th this, if you, if you pay attention, this is said uh, in all traditions. I remember when I was young and I was uh, in church that, that they would say that, you know, as soon as you say, okay, I want to work on on this particular flaw that I, uh, they would say the uh, Satan will hear that and will come to on your way and put ten, put temptations so that that you don't do it that you don't succeed. Well, from a theosophical point of view, I wouldn't say that that is Satan. On the contrary, that person is helping you or that whoever that is or the law of karma is helping you because. That's the only way we can overcome something. How can we overcome anything but by facing it? You know, so this is in all traditions, the, the idea of this process. <laughs>